Hi, everybody. I'm Rob Tufel from Cancer Support Community. And we are just, we're live here at Cancer Support Community, just waiting for everybody to come on the webinar. Uh, you can't see, maybe you can see actually. I see the people are coming on. We have over 90 people registered for today's webinar. So we'll just give it a few more minutes as everybody gets on. Um, they're coming on quickly. All right, we seem to have a little low. It's like watching a horse race. We can see the number getting on um, right now. We'll just give it a few more minutes. Uh, with me, um, and we'll introduce soon again, is our new board president. Actually, not so new anymore, Donald. You've been here six months, and you've been on the board for a while. Yeah, and I'm but, still here. But and I'm still here. I don't know how much longer, though. <laughs> <laughs> Our new board president, Donald Duggan, and off camera, which you can't see, but we can, we have Andy Duggan, who's at Andy Duggan, <laughs> Andy Dunn, who's our donor support manager, and he will be doing things behind the scenes in case there are any problems. So you may occasionally see us talking to the corner, and that's Andy who we are talking to. So we will give it uh, just a few more seconds, and then I think we will get started. How's the, how are we doing with the attendance, Andy? We're up to uh up to 33 right now. Okay, we should. We had a lot of people registered, so we'll give it a little more time and uh, then we will get started. So I hope everybody is having a good day and um, I hope you enjoy the, the webinar. All right, you ready, Donald? Yeah, well, let's give it a couple more minutes. All right, we'll give it a couple more minutes. Yeah. We don't want to penalize the people who are, got on late, but we will definitely give it a couple of more minutes. Sometimes it takes it takes time when all these people get on. We also have some of our staff are also registered so that they can inform us if there are any problems. And if you are having any problems, please put, uh, you can put something in the question and answer if you're having trouble hearing us um, or you're having trouble getting connected or any issues, um, just put it in the question and answer and we will be happy to help you. Let's see. Okay. We got started in a Linda few has raised her, Linda has raised her hand. Don't know if she can see what she. All right. Let's see if there, we Andy. can see there, Andy. Okay. Up to four. I see we're at forty-two. I can see Andy. All right, so why don't we get started? Yeah, sounds good. So my name is Rob Tufel. I am the CEO of Cancer Support Community. I would like to welcome all of you today to our virtual town hall meeting. And this is really a chance for us to give you an update about the activities at Cancer Support Community. With me today, as I mentioned, I'd like to introduce Donald Duggan, who is our new board president. Donald, you've actually been on the board for how long? Board. 10 years now. 10 years. 10 years. 10 years. And Donald assumed the role of uh, board president starting in January. We're so happy he did it. That's an incredible amount of work, and we appreciate everything he does. Um, and I just want to remind everybody that this meeting is being recorded today, and we'll be sending out the link. And also for people uh, you know who may want to watch this and didn't have a chance, we'll be able to watch it as well. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A. Everybody see the Q&A down there? We do not have a chat, but we have a Q&A and we would be able to, we'll be happy to answer those questions after the presentation. Um, so let's get started. So what are we gonna cover today? Basically, we wanna talk to you about our new five-year strategic plan, which we, the board approved last December. Um, we also, of course, that includes Lafayette, and we've made some revisions to our plans for a new center in Lafayette. We'll talk to you a little bit about that. We will also talk to you about some of the new program initiatives that we're doing, and also our commitment to health equity in cancer, uh, in cancer care. So those are really the things we're going to cover in this uh, quick 45-minute session. Of course, both of us are available at any time. If you have any questions, um, uh, please feel free to email us if we don't get, um, if we don't get to your questions, please feel free to email us um, or email me directly and I'd be happy to get to your questions. So, Donald, I'm going to turn it over to you. Last December, we had our first in-person board meeting in two years. For two years. Is that right? Two years. Yeah, Amazing. Correct. And uh, we talked a lot about our strategic plan. And Donald, do you want to go over or give us a high level view of 
what the goals and what we're looking at over the next five years? Yes, yes. And so, you know, early in the year, the, the board put together a committee comprised of board members, staff with the purpose of developing a five-year strategic plan. Yep. Uh, the, the committee also reached out to some of our key stakeholders and got feedback from the community as well uh, and developed the, the, the plan that was presented and approved by the board in December of last year. Uh, three, three key points for the, the strategic plan. One is around making sure that we continue to advance, enhance, and create new programs uh, so that we can achieve our mission of making sure that we provide good outcomes for all patients uh, and their families in all of our communities. And so uh, one of the things that we learned out of COVID, we, we improved our ability to deliver our services virtually, right? And so that, that really allows us to reach a lot more people. We wanna continue to improve on those changes, continue to enhance our programs and, and figure out ways to continue to reach more people in all communities uh, in the Bay Area. Uh, and so, you know, expanding our reach to support the families, not just in Walnut Creek, but all communities that are impacted by cancer. Uh, we want to serve as many people as we can uh, to help them deal with the very challenging times that they have uh, with cancer. And then the third thing that the plan does is identify ways for us to diversify our source of funds. Uh, I mean, we want to make sure that we're here for the long term. And so we want to make sure we're creating new opportunities to raise funds to support our program. Great, great. So that's really a high level view of our strategic plan over the next five years. So we want to give you just some more detail about what that looks like in implementation process. And we've already started to implement some of those things in the strategic plan, some of those goals. So as Donald mentioned that we really want to look at new programming. And some of that new programming involves technology. We've all, we're coming, I'm not sure, are we out of the pandemic yet? I'm not sure, but we're still coming out of the pandemic. But one thing we've learned from that is about the power of technology. Here we are today, an example of the way we can provide support, we can provide information to you um, in your home without you needing to come to our center. And by the way, we're broadcasting live from our center in Walnut Creek. And as a reminder, we also have a satellite office in Antioch. So some of the ways we've been looking at using technology is a program, is a pilot program we just lost, launched. And this is a program that's taking place across the country, actually. What we are doing is providing digital tablets to low-income cancer patients and their families that are preloaded with supported supportive programs, and we're also hooking them up with a federal program where they can get funding for broadband access if they don't have it already. And we know that many under-resourced communities, people in many under-resourced communities, while everybody was accessing Zoom, or lots of people were accessing Zoom, there was a segment of the population that didn't have access to the internet. So the question for us was, how can we get our support services to people that may not have access to the internet and how can we make it as easy as them to get the support they need when diagnosed and that's what this pilot program is about we are connecting we just last week had a meeting with highland hospital where we talked to them we talked to a group of oncologists about this program but that is the one of the ways we're trying to increase our footprint in the communities in all communities but also using technology as a way of increasing accessibility as well Another thing that we're doing, um, we're also um, looking at ways to build out the organization, increase our network. We just had our first meeting of our community impact board. That board is composed of young professionals who are looking for a way that they can learn more about nonprofit organizations and also make an impact in their community. We've also revamped our professional advisory board. So that is a group composed of health professionals, social workers and doctors and nurses, from across all the centers in the Bay Area who provide us advice and to really key us in to things that they can offer to provide support to patients and their families. Um, we also are looking at new collaborations in Antioch. As many of you know, we opened up a satellite office in Antioch right before the pandemic. So that center has been slow to grow for obvious reasons, but now once we've reopened, we've been able to start holding programs there. And one of our goals is how do we collaborate with community groups to hold programs 
directly in our sites so we can inc increase our reach, we can also increase our collaborations, and we can also decrease duplication of services. So those are some of the things, and you'll be hearing more and more about those type of programs. We are also, I think I, you, many of you may know that we receive funding to look at the needs of black cancer patients and their families in the Bay Area. And this is a population that has consistently um, had higher morbidity rates, higher death rates and lower survival rates. Part of this was our, part of the efforts was hiring an outreach manager who is making special efforts to reach out to underserved communities, under-resourced communities, with a special focus on black cancer patients and their families. And this summer, we are working with a graduate student, a public health graduate student at Berkeley, to present a report on the needs, the psychosocial needs, the social needs, and the practical needs of black cancer patients, but not just identifying their needs, recommendations for things we can do and things other organizations can do to better meet those needs. And that not only falls under the strategic goal of building new programs, it also falls under the strategic goal of looking for ways that we can reach out to communities who traditionally may not have been getting the support that they need and the support that they deserve when diagnosed with cancer. Um, we are also expanding our counseling program. That was something that was remarkable during the pandemic. We had waiting lists for our free counseling program. Anyone who's known, anyone who try, has tried to get access to a licensed therapist or to therapy, any type of therapy, knows how difficult it is. At Cancer Support Community, we actually have a training program where we train doctoral students to work with oncology patients. And as part of that program, they provide free counseling under the supervision of a licensed mental health professional. And we expanded that program this year so we have more doctoral students who are able to provide more services because we had a waiting list throughout the pandemic. And the pandemic, once again, really highlighted to us the need for our services, especially for mental health services. So that is a program we're expanding to. Donald also mentioned that we're going to diversify our funding. So what does that look like? Well, we've had our gala, everybody's been to galas, you all out there in the, in the virtual universe have been to galas, you've probably been to our galas, we hope you've been to our gala. We thought, is there a way to revamp our gala to make it more exciting, interesting, relevant? So instead of having a gala in a hotel on a Saturday night, we're having a gala in the Grove. We're having it on a Sunday afternoon. It's going to be an incredibly fun event. We hope you'll come. We'll be sending out invitations and have more information. But one way we are doing to, we, one way, one, one of the efforts we are making to try and do things differently in our organization. And um, finally, I wanted to talk to you about Lafayette because I know that's a big interest for many of you and many, many in the community have worked hard um, to, to, with us to look at ways we can build a new support center in Lafayette. So the pandemic really brought home two issues. One was, as many of you know, the cost of construction just skyrocketed. So the original budget we had for building a new center in Lafayette has really increased dramatically to a point where as an organization, raising those type of funds will be a challenge for us. That's just one piece though. The other piece is the way people have accessed programs has changed significantly. I don't have to tell all of you out there um, what, how that people use virtual programs, that people access things virtually. I read about it in the paper every day. Salesforce, I just read this in the Chronicle the other day. Salesforce is actually offering incentives to their employees if they come back to work. One of the incentives is they'll donate to the charity of their choice. So if there's any Salesforce employees out there, I hope you will go back to work and list Cancer Support Community as your charity of choice. But we know that readership on bar, uh, ridership on BART is down. We know that faith-based communities, people are not participating in person. And we are seeing the same thing at Cancer Support Community. We reopened in September, but the majority of our participants are still, um, are still prefer to access their services virtually and maybe come in once every six months or come in once every quarter for an in-person. Prior to 2019, as many of you know, you could not find a parking space in the parking lot because we were at capacity in this, in this site that we're at, that I'm standing in now. That is not the case. So for us as an organization, when we met in December to talk about our strategic plan, we also talked about Lafayette. And 
we talked about the increased costs, and we also talked about the practicality of building a 12,000 square foot building if the building that we have now is not being used at capacity. But along with that, the original intention of the site in Lafayette was always to provide an incredibly healing natural environment for participants as something, as a place where they could go to get away from the institution of the hospital, a place where they could be in nature without having to travel two hours to go up to Tahoe or to go up to the country, wherever they were gonna go. So we thought, how can we utilize this space short of building a building at the current time? We did not wanna go through a three-year planning process again, like we did, everybody knows, all of those who were involved knows how much work that took and how long that took. So we approached the Lafayette Planning Department and said, here's what we're proposing. We want to put in a road, pave the road with the original plan so people can get in. We want to put in the parking lot, the gravel parking lot, where the original parking lot was. We'd like to put in some portable bathrooms, and we'd like to put in some spaces where we can begin holding programs outside. So imagine taking a yoga class outside, or imagine sitting, uh, doing an ex another exercise class outside, or being able to utilize the site to do walks or meditation walks. So we thought, how can we get this site activated quickly so family members, cancer patients can start programs there now. We approached the planning department and we worked with them. We worked with our original planners to come up with a plan to be able to do just that. And actually next Monday, we will be presenting this plan to the Lafayette Planning Commission um, and we, it is our hope that they will approve it. Um, we are very, feel very strongly they will. We are not altering radically from what we um, originally um, uh, proposed to them. But this will enable us to be able to use the site um, right away. Um, once we get the approval, we have the money already from money we've raised. We can start the construction. We can start the development of the site. Um, and then hopefully this fall, we'll be able to start offering some programs there but still have our existing building here and in Antioch and also continue to offer programs virtually. We are also requesting an extension on our um, um, entitlements. We certainly don't wanna give those up. And, and the pandemic has changed things. Um, Lafayette now grants five-year entitlements. So we are requesting um, uh, extension of our entitlements for five years. So at a later point, we can once again assess about building a center at that site that can serve the community and serve the community of cancer patients and their families. This is what we know. We, don't, we know that the number of cancer patients will increase. We know every year, 2 million people almost are diagnosed with cancer in the United States and that number is going up. We know that um, hospitals are expanding their cancer programs. What we don't know yet, I don't think anyone knows unless you've been through a pandemic, is whether this change in how people use services is a permanent change. Will people continue to prefer doing things virtually? Or will people at some point wanna come back only in person and we will be confronting the issue of capacity in our Walnut Creek site like we did prior to the pandemic? So that is our plan for Lafayette. We're super excited about it. We've met one-on-one -on -one with our supporters, some of our larger donors who've given uh, their investment to this program. They are excited about this revised plan. We are excited about this revised plan. We have not given up on our vision. We're just taking a little detour, you could say, because of the pandemic in response to the pandemic, because as you know, that has really changed things. Right, and, and, I, and I would rephrase it from a detour to saying, We've learned our lessons from the pandemic. The yes. pandemic has taught us that if nothing else, you need to learn to be flexible. And so we're being flexible. We're still committed to providing healing services out of that great location. Uh, you know, it's prudent for us to manage our funds effectively. Our donors have entrusted us and to do things that provide for the longevity of this organization. And so that's why we modified our plan. That's exact. That's a perfectly, this is why Donald is our president. <laughs> Um, that's exactly that's exactly correct. So we hold on to the original vision. Yeah. As an organization, as you know, out there in virtual land, it is our mission to improve the health outcomes and the quality of life of people diagnosed with cancer and their families. 
And whether we're doing our uh, revised plans in Lafayette, whether we're looking at our Antioch Center, that has not changed. And we remain true to that mission. And as supporters of Cancer Support Community, we want to keep you informed about our plans because we know that you are making an investment in this organization. We are proud of the work that we do and the support we provide in the community and our 30 year history in the community. But it's important for us that we communicate with you to tell you all the great work that we're doing. So you will continue to support us and you will continue to tell your neighbors and your friends and your families who may need support when they're diagnosed with cancer that there is a place in the community. So I wanna switch gears a little. And once again, we're happy to take questions. And if we don't get to your questions, you can email me directly. Um, we're always available. Uh, Donald, do you wanna talk about health equity in cancer care? Because we talked about that at a lot at our, we talk about that a lot as an organization, certainly the past three years, certainly since the opening of Antioch, but Antioch was just one step. But at the board meeting, we also talked about that a lot. Do you wanna talk a little bit, uh, share with the- Yeah, just, just, just yes. briefly. And I think you know, Rob has touched on some of the points. So as you all are aware, cancer does not discriminate, right? However, everyone doesn't have equal access to the services need, needed to help them deal with, whether it's from the medical side or whether it's from the services side. And so our, our goal is to kind of bridge that gap. And we wanna make sure that every person, regardless of what community they live in, that they've got equal access to the services that will help them deal with cancer. And so, you know, we're, we're committed to that. We've talked about that. Uh, you know, we've opened our center in Antioch. We're, we're, we're committed to that. Uh, we had a kickoff, as Rob said earlier, back out in the community. Uh, we're developing partnerships with those in the community. We, we are focused really hard on building the trust in those communities that will hopefully enable them and, and give them the trust to start using the services that can help them uh, deal with, with, with cancer. And so I mean, that, that'll be our focus. Uh, as Rob mentioned, we've also hired an outreach uh, manager. Uh, we, we're forming partnerships in Oakland as well uh, to figure out how we can reach those in that community and inform them around the services that we offer. Because at the end of the day, the more you know around what's available, the better the opportunity you might actually utilize. And so our big mission is to make sure we get the word out about here's who we are, here's what we do, here's how we can help you. And hopefully people will, will respond to that. That's great. And you know, for us, we say at Cancer Support Community, cancer may treat everybody equally, but not everyone with cancer is treated equally. And our focus as an organization in health equity always has to be through the lens of cancer care, because that's what we do. And how do we create community and how do we create a sense of belonging for everybody? And we know, I think Donald, you've said this to me, this is not a sprint, this is a marathon. We know this will not be easy. We know as an organization, we have a lot of work to do, but the board and the staff, and also I would say the participants who use our services are committing to seeing this organization as diversified as possible because we all share that common goal that everybody with cancer and their families deserve support. We should not be leaving some people behind. And I was really enjoyed at the board meeting hearing that discussion and even in our strategic plan that health equity was listed as really as one of our foundational commitments and something that we wanna weave through everything we do, whether it's our programs or whether it's our fundraising events or it's whether who we speak to in the community and what community groups we're talking to. So that is something that I think was really, during the pandemic was, I don't wanna say was, was a new thing, but it was really reinforced and refreshing and, and refreshed, yes. I would say. Yeah. And, and, and we hear the same thing from our donor community. Right? I mean, they're, they're donating to this organization because of what we're trying to do in terms of making sure that we're, create, we're creating equity for all communities that are impacted by cancer. Right. And I want to remind everybody that on our website, you can find our latest impact report. Once again, that's just another way of uh, communicating with your impact report in 2022 of what we're doing, how much money we've raised, how many people we've served, what the participants say about our programs, what type of programs we're doing. Um, you're also welcome to email me directly or call me. I'm always happy to meet with you individually to share information with you. We're proud of what we're doing. We also send out quarterly impact e-newsletters, which highlight some of the more recent things that we are doing as an organization. Once again, all of this is done, all of these efforts are done as a way to say thank you for your support 
and to keep you informed of how we are using your donation because we want to be good stewards of your donation and you help us to fulfill the mission of providing support to cancer patients and their families. So it's about 525. Um, we said we would go till 545. So let's see, Andy, do we have any questions from the virtual audience? I have to tell you, it's very strange. We're down here with Donald. I'm talking to you all. You can see me. We can't see you. Um, it's sort of like being on TV. Maybe we have, maybe Donald, newscasting in your future? What do you uh, think? He says it's just strange to be here with me, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's see some questions. Andy's holding up. The question was, how about a community garden at Lafayette? Absolutely. So that is something that this will permit us to do. Once we get onto the site, we can do things like a community garden. We can do things like putting in walking paths where people can go to do meditative walking or just to, once again, take a break from the hospital setting. Um, what's, you know, I think what was really, you know, as a board and a staff, we have this beautiful piece of property. It's sitting empty. We have these two challenges. And really we said, how can we get this site up and running as quickly as possible so people can use it to build exactly those type of things like a community garden. Imagine taking a, a nutrition class while you're standing in a community garden. I think that is incredibly exciting and learning how to grow things and what plants and vegetables are good for you while you're uh, dealing with cancer. And even having her members help build the garden, right? Help plant the garden, put things in yeah. the garden. Great, let's see, do we have other questions? Um, there are a couple of questions about encouraging in-person participation, if there's strategy behind it. And yeah. one specific question was yes. having more teachers in person to, to bring in more people. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Yes, so yeah, go ahead, Don. I was gonna say, why don't you repeat that? Just oh, that's good. Make sure um, everybody heard it. So the question, that was a good, thank you. See, you should be a newscaster. <laughs> so the question was what we are doing to encourage in-person um, uh, participation. So we, um, we are trying different things. We're trying different social social events. Um, actually, as Donald mentioned in Antioch about, was it a month ago, we had a reopening. Um, we had probably 70 people turn. So we're trying to do the social events. We are trying to get teachers to come in person. Some teachers don't wanna come back in person, but sometimes we have teachers come back in person and they're the only one in person and everybody else is on the screen. We are trying to, um, we had, I think, a, a chocolate a social event. Um, we had holiday parties. We're planning on bringing some therapy dogs in. Actually, I just told the staff today, Frank, uh, who is a dog from Israel, uh, it's a long story, but he's a therapy dog from Israel who will be visiting in, uh, we hope, August. So we're doing those type of things. But if you have other suggestions, email me because we are open. I think once again, a lot of different communities, I mentioned the faith-based community are also struggling with ways to get people back in person. Some people don't wanna come in person because it's just easier, right? We know what traffic is like. Also, some people are sick. Um, on the flip side, what we could do before the pandemic in terms of outreach was much, much more limited as what we can do now. I just gave a talk last week with one of our board members, Patty Falconer in Burlingame, right? Um, before the pandemic, people in Burlingame could not participate in our program. They can now. So there's also an opportunity. We don't want to lose, we don't want to lose the virtual aspect because there's also an opportunity to reach more people who can't physically come to this location or come to Antioch. But email me your suggestions. I would love to hear them. Uh, we are open. And, and I'll add to that, you know, we, we, one of the things that we're doing is we're being very responsible to our members. And our members are really dictating a lot around how we're offering our services. Right. And if a majority of our members are saying we want to do it virtual, we need to respond to that. And so it's not as if we're actually controlling the toll gates around whether we're live or whether we're in person. It's really how our members are responding. And so as members start to want to come back into the offices more and use our services in, in, in person, we'll respond to that. And we'll make sure we've got the resources uh, to, 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 to provide those services in person as that Pizza. That's right. And, you know, I would add, as many of you know, we're part of a national organization. We operate independently. All of your donations stay local. We're a separate 501c3. But we're part of a national cancer support community. So we're in constant touch with affiliates across the country in Chicago and L.A. in Denver. Um, and they're seeing the same thing. So we're not unusual. Some states, I think there was like Kentucky, which things never close like they did in California. It's maybe a different culture or Texas and things opened up quicker. They've had an upper 
uh, quicker uptake in people coming back in person. But many, many centers um, that were uh, had more restrictive, I would say, policies during the pandemic are seeing similar things where people are just not wanting to come back in person. But I have to say, you know, I always am reminded of the person who participated in a support group from their hospital bed, um, which was not possible before the pandemic. And I think that's remarkable when we think about how isolated and scared people are in the hospital to be able to sit in your bed and access services and find a community of support um, via, the, via the virtual aspect is incredibly powerful to me. Um, oh, question about Margaret. Yes, Margaret Stouffer, as many of you know, is our amazing uh, chief mission officer. And Margaret, I think we put out a message a few months ago, Margaret will be retiring at the end of this year. So in December, she's been here for what, 20 years? Is that? 20 plus years. Yeah, M Margaret is, is amazing um, and stay tuned. We will be doing something. I will, I will share that with you at another time um, to say goodbye to Margaret. So yes, we have started the process of looking for Margaret's successor. Um, uh, the plan is to have some overlap with that person and Margaret so she can train them, but we are on track and you know that position will be very hard to fill because Margaret has just done some amazing things for this community, but we are in the process of doing that. And as soon as we hire somebody, um, we will let you know that as well and communicate with you. All right. When will John Muir Center open and will we be there? So a question was, when will John Muir Center open and will Cancer Support Community be there? Great question, thank you so much. That's an example of one of the cancer centers that is expanding um, in response to what we know is going to be this wave, this growing increase in uh, this increase in cancer patients. Um, so as far as I know, the plan is that John Muir, and you should contact John Muir for to get the, the, the um, most up-to-date information, but they will they're planning on opening in February of 2024. And we have a very close relationship with John Muir as we do with many of the hospitals in the Bay Area. And they have reserved a space for us in their new center, which is incredibly nice. So the plan is next year is to actually have a CSC staff person, a cancer support community staff person on site in the hospital, which will just help so much in terms of getting the word out to patients and being where the patients are. And I should add, one thing I forgot to mention, Donald, is you know we talked about um, um, how reaching more communities. We have significantly over the past two years increased our outreach efforts. Um, you may have seen our bus ads. We have bus ads throughout the East and West County um, in English and Spanish. That's one thing we've done. But we're also doing a pilot test with a community-based cancer center right here. Um, where we are trying to integrate into their protocol. So what that means is right now, a lot of times our relationships, whether someone gets referred to cancer support community is dependent on our relationship with a doctor or a nurse. We all know how busy doctors and nurses are. We also know that doctors and nurses and health professionals leave. So the question was, how can we actually get integrated into the database, into the, the, the um, it's not the database, but it's the management system, the data management system um, in a hospital. So patients are automatically referred to us and then they can choose whether they want to access our services. So we're right now doing a pilot test, as I mentioned with Bass Medical, it's a local community-based organization. There's a press release on our website um, and it's going really well. I'm really, really pleased that it's not dependent on the doctors or the nurses to do this, but patients automatically get referred and then they can choose once again, whether to access our services now or at a later point. The other exciting piece about this is we are working with uh, UC Berkeley, uh, graduate, graduate public health student at UC Berkeley, who's going to be looking at the results of this collaboration analyzing the results, seeing things like how many people access their services, what types of services do they access. The goal is to be able to improve our relationships um, with hospitals, use this as a model. We can also share this information with cancer support community centers and affiliates across the country so they can use it. But once again, another step we are taking to be able to better identify patients who may need our services and to increase access so every patient and every family member knows about the services available if they uh, want them. All right, Andy, any more questions? All right, well, it's 5.34. Do you think anybody would be upset if we ended early? 
Uh, I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's been fantastic. Thank you all for attending. Uh, hopefully you know a little bit more about what we do. Uh, and uh, as Rob said, feel free to, to reach out to, to reach out to him, reach out to me, visit our website, uh, figure out ways to continue to be involved with what we're doing here. Yes, and I want to thank you all. Um, you are the reason we are here, our supporters. Um, whether you're donating or you're volunteering, whatever you're doing, you are making an impact in the lives of cancer patients and their family members every day. You're doing that by working with Cancer Support Community. And I just sincerely want to thank you, not only as the CEO of Cancer Support Community, but also as a cancer patient myself. I know the importance of these, uh, these services and as, as you all do as well. And if you have any questions, once again, contact us. We'll share the link. I think we have a short survey that's going to hopefully will pop up if I did this right. Um, and I want to thank everybody for being here today. And we look forward to being in touch and letting you know about what's going on in Cancer Support Community. Thank you so much and have a good evening. Take care. Bye bye, everybody. Okay, now I have to figure out how to shut it off. All right, let's see.